Okay, folks. Um, look, I'm going to start by, I'm going to be introducing each of the panelists. Maybe each one can come up. Adam, I actually I don't think we have a chair for you, so you can kind of stand up here. So I'll actually bring you up last. How's that? That way you can take over the microphone. Um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Lyons, president of Zapotec Energy. Paul has been active in the energy industry in New England for over 25 years, has extensive experience in all levels of solar design and development. He's led all of Zapotec's projects performing site assessments, evaluating feasibility, developing conceptual and final designs for systems, procuring materials and resources, and supervising construction startup. He currently sits on the board of directors of the Solar Energy Business Association of New England and is a member of the American Solar Energy Society. He's a registered mechanical engineer and construction supervisor and a certified PV installer. Next, Michelle Buck who is the town planner for Leicester and Spencer, Massachusetts. Michelle has more than 18 years of professional experience as a public sector planner. She currently serves, as I mentioned, those, the town, town planner for those two towns of Leicester and Spencer. She oversees long-range planning, zoning amendments, and project permitting, including several recent ground-mounted solar projects. She has previously worked for the town of Charlton, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and the town of Framingham, and has served on the board of the Mass Association of Planning Directors since 2004. Third on our panel is David Murphy, who is a vice president with Tig and Bond. David's a civil engineer with 25 years of senior project management experience, specializing in landfill engineering. He's managed major infrastructure projects in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami, led an, environment, led, led an environmental engineering firm, and managed major projects for the Commission's Office of the Mass DEP, including the environmental oversight of the Big Dig. He also served as the state's lead landfill engineer and program manager for the Mass Environmental Policy Act projects, including waste, water, waste to energy facilities, landfills, expansions, and power plants. He's currently Tiger Bond's lead solar engineer and a project manager on numerous closed capped and capped landfills in Massachusetts, including sites in Lancaster, East Hampton, Methuen, Dartmouth, and Bridgewater. Um, and the fourth member of our panel is J. Aiden Foley, the principal of Lunessa Solar. Aiden's firm provides owner's representation and project development services for photovoltaic solar projects. Prior to founding Lunessa, Aiden was an early employee of Sun Edison, where he managed 35 megawatts of complete projects of completed projects in 12 states. He's an MIT grad and also attended the Dublin Institute of Technology and is a LEED certified accredited professional. And then to lead our conversation is Adam Brayard, an associate of Prince Lobel. He's the, he's the leader of the firm's Green Energy Development Initiative, is a leader of the firm's Green Energy De Development Initiative, has been at the forefront of their participation in sustainable development projects, and is co-founder of Prince Lobel's Renewables, the firm's renewable energy project management practice. He assists clients in all aspects of the assessment, development, and financing of, of renewable energy projects. He was responsible for hundreds of wild... I'm sorry. Um, recently, uh, Adam and the Prince Lobel Renewables team completed the largest solar energy installation in Chelsea, Mass. So please welcome Adam and this terrific panel, and let's get started. Thanks very much, Peter. And thank you all for attending. Um, we want to do with this panel, it's a little bit different, it's somewhat similar in, in terms of it being more of a discussion and, and not a uh, presentation, so we don't have prepared slides, but I think what we're trying to do here is really bring a practical uh, application and sense to um, the industry for an intro to solar and an overview of strategies and best practices needed um, to develop and execute maintain a solar project and also to, to, to understand how um, entities, companies can take advantage of solar even if in the event that they don't have maybe an infrastructure um, to do so. Um, so what, what I think we're going to do is start by going through uh, the scenarios of different projects from the conception um, and through construction and completion, and then some post-construction um, solar asset management um, services, and then also discuss some case studies that uh, these folks have been involved with, so you can get a real sense of how it works in Massachusetts. You've heard from the prior panelists about the incentives in depth and all the um, advantages 
and disadvantages to in the industry. So what we want to do is kind of take a step back uh, and show you how it really works. We're not going to get very in depth into the actual um, incentives available out there. I think you had a little bit of that this morning. So what I first want to do is talk about how does really the, I'm going to, I'm going to um, address this question generally to the panel, and then I'm going to specifically ask individuals uh, how it works with specific applications. In other words, rooftop, ground mount, landfill, um, feasibility, and financial feasibility, things like that. So the first kind of group of questions is how do you get started? What are the things you need to look for um, when you're thinking about going solar, going green? And before we get to that question, one of the things, it was, it was I think Tim Rowan from National Grid addressed it um, in his presentation, and that is one of the first things you want to do is really not just go right to solar or go right to wind on the roof or, or behind your, your building. You, you really want to take a, a building envelope approach to, um, to your facility if that, if in case, if, if in fact you do have a facility. You want to take a look at energy efficiency and things like that. I mean, that's, that's really want to start. You can do solar and wind concurrently, but you, you certainly don't want to be an energy hog and then just produce more energy on your roof um, and, not, and not help that, that, uh, that potential issue. One of the first questions I have is, from a feasibility standpoint, what are the things you need? What are the things you need to look for? If I'm a building owner, Paul, if I'm a building owner, and I want to get into solar, what, what are the what are the initial steps I need to take? Um, if you own the building, or if, even if you lease the building, um, and the roof is flat, the good is a good possibility you could do solar on it. If the roof is uh, if it's a gable roof, then it's, it, it needs to face south or within 45 degrees of south, or the southeast or the southwest. And, uh, and it needs to be an energy efficient building. As you said, you need to do all that stuff first, and then uh, the solar will be your icing on the cake. And if you have electric load in the building, uh, you can pretty much scale the solar to, uh, uh, to that load and not overproduce if that's what you want or if, that's, uh, if there's a cap in place. And then Dave, when we're talking about ground mounted facilities, um, not only on clean ground, but also on um, dirty or landfill uh, ground, how, how would a technical developer or owner move forward? How would they move forward with feasibility? Good question. Uh, we represent a lot of municipalities and when the whole solar market hit several years ago, we aggressively went after all the sites that we represent. We, we actually look for the low-hanging fruit. Um, and there's a lot of projects out there, a lot of parcels out there. Um, some of the criteria that we initially used uh, for uh, our clients were specifically uh, size, obviously trying to set a one to two megawatt you know, size for the larger sites. Uh, so you know, five acres per megawatt effectively. So we were looking for generally between 10 and 20 acres of available land. Um, for the landfill sites, clearly you need to have, um, you can put them on any one of the landfill, theoretically. Uh, but we're looking for slopes where the slope is less than by 10% grade uh, and, and south facing. And there's not a tree line that obviously cause blockage and shading. Uh, so those, those are the, the primary ground control uh, areas. As far as wetlands and environmental sensitivity, Screening, so much to do a screening study with a priority resource mapping to see if there's habitat in the area. Uh, if you're in an ACEC in the area of critical environmental concern or other zoning issues that might, might cause a, um, some bumps along the road from that and a lot of permitting time and cost. Uh, on the landfills, also, or the larger ground mount systems, you want to make sure that you're into connection to three phase power. It's not a great length of distance. We had a, a wonderful site in Western Mass. It's perfect for everything except the interconnection cost just through the economics way off. Um, so that's a major one. So that's the first thing you want to be looking for right? in addition to the land itself. Um, other permitting issues obviously zoning and uh, planning board uh, receptivity within the town. Uh, some of our clients, um, unfortunately, one of the two clients where we have significant opposition to solar in the town. I won't name the towns, but you might know from the news. Um, so I guess that's, a, that's the first wave of response. Sure. The, um, in, in piggybacking on the, the, 
question, especially with respect to the landfills. The, the landfills need to be capped. If they do need to be capped, is there post closure requirements? And is there is there a time that they need to be that they need that their cap needs to be in existence, or is it uh, is it all lose by case? Um, diving into a little more detail on the landfill sites, which is my specialty. Um, specifically, the landfill does have to be capped. And in Massachusetts, where, where the market exists right now, um, if it's a pre-71 landfill that closed prior to 1971, in theory, it does not need to have a cap. It just needs to have some soil cover on top of it. And that can be regulated under the 21E program, the MCP program we call it here in Mass. Um, if it's a post-1971 site, meaning it operated as a landfill after 1971, then yes, it does need to have a cap soil or a combination of soil and synthetics that's been approved by the department, uh, not just the town thinks it as a cap. Uh, so you need documentation from the Mass DEP. Uh, those facilities that were capped generally prior to 1990 are soil covers. Uh, some of them are synthetic and those capped after 1990 are synthetic covers. Um, you do a triage with your local DEP uh, and again you want to look for making sure that that, that cap is in compliance with the department because you could be biting off far more than want to choose. So. Thanks. And Michelle, when a potential developer or even a building owner um, is interested in, in installing uh, a solar facility either on, on the ground or, or on the roof, can you give us a sense of what they should be looking for uh, with respect to permitting? Um, it, it seems that you know there, there is regulation in Massachusetts that makes it somewhat exempt, but sometimes don't interpret it, or times interpret it different ways, similar to, to the tax regulations. Can you give us a little insight on that? Sure. I mean, to start with, in Massachusetts, um, as you know, you may know, there are 351 separate municipalities, and, and each of them treats this issue a little bit differently. Um, I can mainly speak to the communities I work for. They're uh, both town meeting forms of government with uh, board of selectmen, one has an elected planning board, one has an appointed planning board. Um, there are some commonalities, and despite there are some differing interpretations of sort of um, how broad the state exemption is, and, and, and different towns do interpret it differently, um, and there's a range of options. I think by this point, um, certainly if my experience is any indication, planners are being inundated with phone calls from solar developers. Um, multiple phone calls per week sometimes, meetings with people. Um, so my sense is that most communi communities by now, because this has been going on for a couple of years, have made some kind of determination as to how they're going to classify and treat these uses. Um, and I'll just, I'll give this an example, you know, these examples of two communities that I work for. Um, one community, the town of Spencer, decided that it would fit into an existing use category in their zoning bylaw. And many communities might go that route. Um, the category they used was major utility. So instead of having to write a whole new section of their zoning bylaw, they, they, class, they said, okay, we've already got this existing category, major utility. It requires a special permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals, ZBA, and also site plan review with the planning board to look at things like drainage and landscape buffers and, and those kind of things. In the other community I work in, Leicester, um, we did not have any use in our existing bylaw that was similar. Um, and the way our bylaw is written, if a use isn't listed, it's prohibited. So the town worked on uh, writing a solar specific bylaw um, a couple of years ago to allow that use. I should say the two communities that I work in are generally very supportive of this use. They want to look at the particulars, um, but they're generally in favor of those uses. In terms of um, preparing uh, to go forward in a town, I mean, yes, I am, I am sort of inundated with phone, calls, with phone calls, but those phone calls are important um, because the more information that you can get ahead of time, the better, um, and because the process is so different from community to community, you really want to have contact with that community. If, if there's a town planner, terrific, that's a good starting point. Many communities in Western Mass in particular do not have a town planner, so you might be speaking with the building inspector or zoning enforcement officer. Sometimes that's the same person. Um, 
So the basic questions to ask are sort of where in town are they allowed? Are they allowed everywhere or are there specific zoning districts? What's the process? Is it a special permit which requires you know, public hearings? Or is it um, site plan review which sometimes requires a hearing, sometimes doesn't. It depends on the community. Um, another thing that's important to ask, I think, um, which was referenced is sort of what is the receptiveness in that particular community um, to this type of use? Is there a lot of opposition? Is it generally viewed as a, uh, as a good use? Um, and if the community's already approved other solar projects, what are the obstacles that have been in the way? Maybe you can ask for copies of the decision, you know, prior decisions for the use to see what kind of conditions the community may impose. Um, and also, you know, asking about scheduling, because that, that also varies, I think, uh, pretty consider considerably from community to community, sort of how quickly um, a project can get through. Although from my perspective, and I think this is probably true in most places, um, the most well-prepared and complete applications can get the fastest review. I mean, maybe that's an obvious thing to say, but I think I think sometimes there's a tendency, especially in the new industry, and I've seen it, to sort of submit a slapdash application to try to meet some submittal deadline, but it really doesn't make the process go any faster in the long run, and in fact holds things up and can, can frankly be annoying to the permitting boards. Um, so it's better to do it well, even if it's a few weeks later. So I guess that's fine. Nice. So it gives you a sense of some of the things you need to start thinking about practically when you're, when you're considering the installation of the solar project. Um, the next thought is, well, how do you afford this? These are pretty expensive and not, not at good parity yet. Um, the other panel did talk about uh, pricing, a uh, module price coming down to get it, it has. Um, but they're still pretty expensive. And so one of the questions you need to ask yourself, well, do we have the capital? If you don't have the capital to, uh, to install the facility, can you get the capital or can you, can you, can you enter into a, a, a project or agreement that brings capital? And I think what Abe is going to ask you a question generally, how, what have you seen um, developers or building owners or, or entities, individuals interested in, in getting into the solar industry? How are they? How are they proceeding with um, dealing with that, those issues, um, and, and what are the different types of, I guess, deals that are out there? Great. Well, thank, thank you for that, and uh, thanks for the Worcester Business Journal for inviting me to participate. Um, as uh, Adam refers to, and I think most people who are here are probably familiar with, there's um, the financing side of these projects is, is quite a bit more complex than the, than the um, physical side, at least if you're thinking about a rooftop project, the ground mounts get, get complicated in some ways. Um, there are federal incentives and there are state incentives and not everybody can use the federal incentives. The state incentives um, can be complex. There are some footfalls in the state incentive process that someone who's not in the solar business just may not want to be exposed to. Um, and as a result of that, the solar industry and a, a group of investors that like investing in projects with tax benefit, tax assets have put together some uh, great financing programs that have really been responsible for the growth of the industry over the past five years. Um, so you know, I think the first question, as Adam says, do you have the capital um, or do you want to deploy capital to a solar project? And there, there are plenty of reasons why you may not want to do that. There are reasons why you why you may. Um, and the good news is if you um, if you want to use a financing product, there, there are a range of financing structures available. The, the, the most common one is known as a PPA where um, a provider essentially owns a project that they that they build typically at your site, typically at the site of your business doesn't have to be. And they sell you energy, they sell you kilowatt hours just the same way as the utility does. And you pay every time the meter clicks over one, you pay them for a kilowatt hour. And you have no further exposure to the projects. That's a very, very attractive structure for someone who doesn't really want to be in the, the minutia of the solar business. Um, um, behind the scenes, the developer of the project is packaging the project into a uh, a company, a limited liability company, which they in turn sell to a, 
a tax equity investor, typically a big bank or a big insurance company. Um, and with that structure, there's a cost of capital involved, and there's a the developer needs to be paid for structuring the deal. So um, there has recently um, come upon a process of establishing a, a lease, um, which is different to a PPA, and that you make you make a monthly payment, and it is. <coughs> not dependent on how many kilowatt hours that the solar project delivers to you. The advantage of that is that the cost of capital can be lower, um, resulting in uh, effectively a cheaper cost of energy for the, for the facility owner, as long as they accept the fact that they're not no longer paying per kilowatt hour. Um, and then for those of you who are tax paying entities and have significant um, tax bills, um, it may very well be worth thinking about uh, financing the project yourself um, because your cost of capital uh, may very well be lower than the private financers that are backing the leases and, and the PPAs. Um, the, the important thing to bear in mind is that the, um, up, up to half of the value of these projects resides in tax benefits. You have a tax credit and you have depreciation. Um, tax credit is fairly straightforward. You get a dollar for dollar. You have a tax credit. You use it on your tax return. The federal Treasury gives you a dollar back. Um, depreciation can be a less attractive um, um, tax shield to use. So some parties don't don't want depreciation, or they have depreciation from other sources. Um, they, 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 so the ownership works for some folks. Um, leases and, uh, and PPAs are really the, the, the three options. And there's Courses for courses amongst all three. Great. So, if you're a building owner, you're not sure if you want to uh, distribute capital for rooftop installation or something on the ground. There are options for um, others to 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 buy that system and put it on your roof, and you enter into contracts with that. What that allows you to do is is to not have an initial capital outlay. You wouldn't be able to take advantage of, of the tax incentives that are out there because you don't own the system, but you would take advantage of the green power on your roof as well as that would most likely be some sort of a discount to what you currently be paying. Um, what about the instance where uh, there's an entity uh, that doesn't have the infrastructure and is maybe in a building that they don't own, but it's a high user of energy. Do they have an option? Um, well, in Massachusetts, you've, uh, we, we have a great program called Virtual Net Metering, which is um, um, it's the only state that has an effective Virtual Net Metering program, and that lets you, within, within reason, that lets you buy energy that's located within the same region of the Commonwealth and use it at your, your site, and that could be a great option. Um, if you've got a short remaining lease, for instance, one of one of the um, problems I've run into a lot over the years is that um, a lot of the um, the smaller um, the, the mid boxes at shopping centers, the, the junior anchors, they typically have five, six, seven years left on their lease. They love solar. Um, they love saving money on energy. Um, they typically have very sophisticated environmental strategies, and but if they've got five years left on their lease, they can't do a twenty year deal with a solar developer on the roof of a building they don't own. So virtual net metering is an excellent option for some folks like that. Um, you still have to think about making a 15 or 20 year commitment, um, but it becomes much more of a financial transaction. You buy, uh, you buy credits that are applied to your bill the month you get the credit. So it's, um, it's a very simple, on a monthly basis, it's a very simple Transaction, you don't have capital out the door, so virtual net meter is a very attractive option, and it's particularly attractive for um, the market is found for municipal customers. Um, the, there's a there's a, a, a theoretically limit to how much net metering, virtual net metering, can occur in the state, and there's a um, an advantageous um, area of the law that lets municipalities um, engage in that more more easily than, than commercial users. So there are options. There are options physically. There are options financially. Um, the, the next, I think, question that we need to consider is how do we find those options? How do we build our team? Who do we use? Um, the great thing about this event is that a lot of those people are here today. Um, but Paul, if you could 
give us a little insight of your experience on how, how you go about that due diligence. Yeah, uh, thank you. Solar is very attractive. I would call it uh, one of the most sexy renewable energy options. And usually when people contact us, they are already emotionally ready to buy and ready to go. And uh, part of our job is to slow them up and get away from the emotion and say, practically speaking, can your building handle this? So what we do first is a, a structural feasibility. Uh, look at uh, chapter 16 of the, of the uh, eighth edition building code. Make sure that any alterations to that roof uh, are compliant. Uh, many, many building owners do not know the spare capacity of the roof for any additional load. The, uh, we were doing some of that structural feasibility uh, the summer before, uh, the last winter, was, winter before we had that uh, record snowfall. We were doing it in the summertime, uh, large shopping centers, uh, what Aiden was saying. Uh, it would look like a two megawatt project if we put all the shopping centers together. The owner was very excited because they wanted to turn around and offer it to the tenants in these uh, strip malls. And we found out when we did structural feasibility that there were no uh, drawings available. These were 1950s, 1960s uh, buildings. No drawings. No one had done a structural evaluation. Uh, two uh, into two or three buildings. We found that there was actually no spare capacity on these roofs. Owners had stopped, paid us for our time, and, and our, our structural engineer subconsultant. Thank you very much. It was a big letdown. No solar, right? Tell somebody I can't have it, or you know, they'd have to make major changes. Then we had a record snowfall. Uh, February 20th, I think it was a, a Tuesday, uh, Saturday evening their roof is starting to buckle. So they clear everyone out of the retail stores. So we're closing early, folks. And they called that structural engineer and said, could you tell us, uh, looking at this roof, where we should start to shovel first? The 50,000 square foot roof you're gonna shovel by hand. You wanna know where you prioritize before the thing collapses. The structural engineer knew just where the defects were and where the, low, the stress points were. They shoveled, the roof was fine. They, they got all the snow off. By the end of the evening, by the early morning, guys worked all night. Um, structural feasibility, you have to do that first. Pass that test and then go on to uh, electrical feasibility or you can do it concurrently. Uh, can your switch gear handle the amount of solar that you think you want to produce? The amount of electricity you think you want to produce? So we go through the, the switch gear and the, uh, for that particular building. Pass that light. Then we go on to interconnection feasibility. If you're in a secondary network, these downtown years, no go, sorry. Or you can go, but it's gonna take you about five years, and then you're still gonna to be told no. So pass uh, interconnection um, piece, and then start that application process. Those are the three most important screens that, that uh, we work with on uh, someone who's interested. And I guess to, uh, to further that point, how do you vet those um, those service providers? You know, structural engineer, your 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 solar installer. Uh, usually, for a structural engineer, you try to find the, the firm that did the design. That is uh, the best if they are still around. Uh, we did some buildings at Harvard, and uh, Susan Truman Partners. Go call them up. Yes, we did that building. They have the records in storage. 18 years later, they pull them out. Plus, Harvard has the records. But you pull those out, and then you, you task them with, all right, I'm going to add uh, eight pounds per square foot on this roof. Uh, what can it handle? Boom, the job's done in about six weeks. It was, it's very helpful to find that original structural engineer. If you can't find one, then you find the best, uh, the, the best structural engineer you can and the best electrical engineer because uh, within a few hours, they will be able to uh, tell you this is going to be good or, or not. So uh, there, uh, usually their fees are not a big concern because uh, what you want is the, the quality of the information that they have. And so you work your network and um, of colleagues and so forth and you find those best people, you bring them to the site 
and uh, establish feasibility. Great. Very well put. Call <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then Aiden, getting back to the financial side of it, in the event that you move forward, but you don't want to bring the capital and you're looking, looking for that. How do, how do some of these entities go forward with that? We, we know that some of the engineering and current construction, the solar developers uh, and installers do have financial backing and can own systems, but how do, how as myself as a as a build, building owner, business owner, uh, how do we vet those? Um, well, at this point, most installers, um, even if their primary business is to be a contractor, they have relationships with um, finance providers, so they will be able to be a primary point of contact and bring you um, uh, a financing type of service. Same way as you know, if you buy a car, the dealer may not actually finance the car, but they'll introduce you to a bank and you can walk out that day with the car. Um, so I would usually start with um, the, the contract, right? I think the um, early decision you need to make is when, when are you going to select a provider and how comprehensive are their, are their services going to be. Um, so you could go down a road where you um, um, selected a design firm like Zabotech and there are other very well-known and qualified local design firms. You can have them do a lot of work on your system, um, at which point you're left with something close to a construction contract and you would bid that out as competitively as you could to qualified bidders and, and get a construction service. Um, and that's a, that's a very good way to, to run a project for some customers. Um, an alternative would be to bring in a, a contractor very early on who would provide a design build type of service, and many contractors do do that. Um, the, the upside of that is that you only have one relationship you need to manage. You, you never, you're never going to be exposed to, uh, um, to anything like finger pointing. The downside is that you, you have to run your competitive procurement very early in the day, and it can be less easy for you to know if you're getting the best, the best deal possible. Um, can also be you're also a little bit more reliant on the qualifications of your service provider at that point. Um, but they're, they're both valid procurement paths. Um, but any EPC out there, EPC is for engineering, um, engineer, procure, and construct. So it's a comprehensive um, um, engineering and construction service. Um, any of them out there should be able to bring financing. Uh, one point about financing is that. Um, it's extremely credit dependent on the quality of your credit and um, you shouldn't be offended if somebody tells you you don't have great credit. The credit requirements in this business are very, very um, demanding for the highest the highest tier of project. The, the finance providers are looking for folks with investment grade credit, which is typically a municipality and there's a couple of hundred companies that have investment grade credit. I mean, maybe more than a couple of hundred, but not, not many. Um, so if you're not if you don't have investment grade credit, if you're a private corporation and you don't want to share your financials, um, you, you maybe should be thinking about using a, um, 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 a, a smaller company that works with more um, innovative, risk-seeking investors. Um, so kind of, I would say self-reflection, how good of a customer are you? Is it a big project? Um, do you have investment grade rating? That, that would determine um, be a big determination of, of what, what the right path to go down is. Great, thanks. So we spent, spent a lot of time on the feasibility of a project. I think that's where you spend most of the time. Um, you really need to know, you need to, you need to turn over all the rocks before you, you start actually spending some, some money, some soft box money on projects. And that leads us into our next phase, which is the soft box phase. You, know, you start designing this, the project, you start getting into Paper and the transaction work on the project, which is very, very similar to a traditional real estate project. Um, you're in a connection in Kirby. Um, we're going to do we to speak to those, those really those four disciplines. In a connection with uh, design, Dave, what are the strategies, options, what are the best practices for a uh, rooftop, a ground mount, um, uh, landfill? You know, we talked about getting the best team, and you did talk a little bit about design, but what are the, what are some of the red herrings and pitfalls you want to stay away from moving forward? I think Paul, I split this question, so I'll leave some of the, the rooftop to Paul, see if you guys interested. 
Um, generally on the design stuff, very similar to the initial start with the job, you want to do your due diligence as well. Um, so one of the first key issues that we always do is a pre-application meeting with both, to assume it's a landfill or, or ground up, uh, with DEP as required, with natural heritage as required, with the planning board or the local conservation commissions uh, to, to search for those screens that would be the killers right up front. So we really try to get to our clients to a no-go as fast as possible and minimize costs. And those are the things you want to make sure that are going on, that you're, see if you can search for those relationships with those uh, regulatory community um, and be able to get it to the decision makers quickly to get to, again, to get them the best advice as, as early up front of the budget as possible. Um, once you've passed that, that due diligence kind of stage, you, know, you want to, as fast as possible, you want to lock in the design concept of the layout and try to minimize that because the exchanges back and forth between the design teams, whether you're structural, your electrical, your geotech, your site civils, you can really run up the design caps fairly high if, if your solar developers are not savvy to, to local development here in New England, if they're not savvy to particularly the New England uh, Massachusetts solid waste management market, you know, and not realizing that making changes automatically requires a change in the permit. And each time you change the permit, you're going to have a cycle of literally four or five months uh, at considerable cost. So some of it is, is literally in the design team we're finding, particularly with solar developers that are coming in from outside of New England not, not familiar with some of the local permitting issues or the state permitting issues, is having to educate our own clients as it relates to permit strategies and design strategies. Uh, other issues, just to quickly uh, lock the concept quickly, get to know real quickly, uh, natural heritage is a real big issue in Massachusetts. We, we have a very strong environmental policy uh, for species and for plants. Uh, and a lot of our area is mapped for that. So must do a priority resource map screening, and then once you've identified that there's, a, there's habitat or a species on the property, get as quickly as possible into natural heritage, identify the species, and identify when this, the study has to be done, what season of the year has to be done, uh, and get that out of the way as fast as possible, because it literally could destroy the project. Um, stay out of the resource areas if you can. Do, don't encroach within a wetland resources at all. Um, you know, and consider the possibility of of a forest management plan for shading, so you can actually lob the tops of the trees down. It's not technically taking the wetlands, but, but it's a way to maximize the solar panel uh, layout numbers on the project. And I guess the last thing, again, goes back to some of working with your developers, uh, constructability. A lot of our solar developers are now, they're primarily rooftop developers, and as they get in a large ground mount to landfills, it's, it's a whole new world of construction, and you know, making sure that whoever the, the is assigned to that on the solar team knows those nuances very well. And yeah, just to dovetail that on the rooftop, any other comments and concerns with design? The top of the structural. Yeah, the rooftop, you gotta make sure it's, if it's in the city, it's not in a historic zone or a, a con you know, historic conservation area. That's always a hassle. Um, if you can see it from the street. The, um, and it's not in these uh, secondary networks in the downtown areas in the, in the metropolitan, uh, like downtown Boston and so forth. I think there's one in downtown Worcester as well. Those are a hassle. You got to stay away from those. And then uh, then you're on the roof and you want to start with a roof that was installed within the last five years. Uh, a new roof or within the last five years. And then uh, the interconnection establish what inverter you're going to use and then stick with that. Do not change your inverters every week. Uh, pick an inverter and then you can mess around with the DC uh, design later on, the, the engineering of that. But uh, get your interconnection, interconnection application in, read the directions, complete the application, like you were saying, with, uh, with everything. And um, read the tariff, memorize the tariff, and get that in. Pay the fee, the, get the one line drawing done, electrical one line, and then uh, wait wait for the response. Right. Michelle, you already mentioned some, some don'ts with respect to the in, incomplete applications. What are some other don'ts and maybe some do's that you've seen that would help with, with design and kind of some of the soft cost permitting processes? And, and I guess mostly this would be ground mounted. I mean, in, in some towns, it, probably speak to this a little more. There is permitting requirement for rooftops, maybe large scale rooftops, but for the most part, 
rooftop installations are going to be building permit or electrical permit only unless there is a prior special permit on that on that building. Yeah, in, in my experience, I mean, and certainly in the communities I work um, with, we, we haven't even seen rooftop applications, but perhaps the communities are mostly rural, or so we seem to be attracting large-scale ground mount, mounted facilities. Um, but, but in terms of uh, do's and don'ts, and I sort of guess I already said, you know, so carefully review the town's um, bylaws and regulation, and, and listen to what town staff tells you in preliminary meetings. I mean, I guess I've had, um, I can think of one instance where um, I had multiple meetings with an applicant with, with a project relatively close to a budding property owners, and they were advised to sort of be proactive um, to address those concerns. And then when the application came in, there was really nothing um, provided to address that. And it just causes delays and sort of having to go back later um, and try to to work with those um, uh, butters. Oh, and another thing, and, and, and this sort of goes with any kind of commercial development, but whether the town requires it or not, to have a clear and concise project narrative in lay terms, this is a really new use, um, so that the boards can understand, you know, how many how many acres of tree clearing are involved in this you know um, project and. Um, you know, where is electricity going? Just the more information, the better, but you know, sort of, like I said, in, in layman terms, so, so people aren't um, lost. Um, I guess, uh, oh, um, this is another um, thing, and I haven't seen it too, too much in solar yet, but it's just sort of a general consideration. Um, you definitely are going to have to expect that um, that you're not going to get an approval typically on the first hearing night of a hearing before a, a new board. There seems to be solar developers that are sort of inexperienced with Massachusetts permitting that's highly unlikely to get an approval the first night. And it's also not typical for a board um, to basically accept an incomplete application and approve it conditioned on submitting stuff later. Um, every once in a while that's allowed, if it's something really, really small, but you really can't expect the community to, to in a sense, approve some element to your project site unseen, like, you know, okay, yeah, sure, you'll get that information to us to us later. So I guess that's another caution. Great. Um, and then getting into the transactional paper of the projects, Aiden, give us a sense of what it takes to, you know, there's this a handful of, depending upon the project, depending upon a deal, you have a lease, you have a utility credit purchase agreement, you have a power purchase agreement, EPC contract. Um, there's a lot of legal work involved. There can be. You can have two leases. You can have a lease for the equipment and a lease for the building. You can, uh, you can kill a lot of trees with solar projects. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the, the agreement between the, the uh, assuming it's an on-site project, um, not the virtual net metering that we, we described earlier. You've got um, you're either going to have a, a financing and installation agreement, the, normally a PPA, but it can be a lease, or um, if it's a process where you're procuring engineering services followed by construction services, and you're going to own the project, then you will have an, an installation agreement, which is looks a lot more like a conventional construction contract. Um, uh, you. Typically, if it's a lease, if it's a PPA or an equipment lease, you're typically giving the uh, owner of that equipment access to your property somewhere buried in the lease, somewhere buried in that PPA, um, a site access license and the ability to come modify the property, fix it, maintain it, take it away. Um, if, if you default, take it away and send you a nasty letter. That's that's in the PPA, um, and. Um, one, one thing to bear in mind is that you're typically going to be, uh, in that instance, a finance project, you're typically going to be entering into an agreement with a shell entity, you know, one Main Street Solar LLC that has no other assets, and that entity is going to be bought and sold and financed and will have tax assets and, and, and what have you. So bear in mind the guy sitting across the table from you or the woman selling you the project is not going to be your legal counterparty. That's not a major, not a major thing to be worried about. 
Um, and then the, the other set of um, paperwork you need to be familiar with is that um, the projects are going to give rise to these interconnection agreements, an interconnection application followed by an interconnection agreement, and a net metering application followed by a net metering agreement. And then the projects have to be registered for SREX. And some clients look for an indemnification for those agreements. So you may have a net metering application, a net metering agreement, and a net metering indemnification. So are these stacks of documents um, that from a day-to-day -day purpose don't mean a whole lot for the host, uh, which is what we call folks who, who just buy the energy um, through a PPA. Really all the host has to do is sign these documents, put them in their file. Um, but you should bear in mind that you're, you're going to be a counterparty to these agreements with the utility for a 15 or 20 year period. But you should be looking to your, your service provider as really carrying out the day to day, the day, -to -day requirements of these agreements. Um, when all is said and done, when you get to the closing table for a large um, solar project that's being institutionally financed, it's not unusual for the closing package to be three, four hundred pages long. Um, you've got O&M manuals, you've got releases of lien, you've got a lot of um, uh, very intensive paperwork involved. And, and luckily, we moved to paperless transactions, but if, if, if it was a stack of paper, it would, it would be this high. Um, so we're starting to run out of a little time here, but I, I do want to hit some uh, some other concerns with best practices for development projects. And the next part is really construction phase and post construction, and then some some case studies that, that you uh, folks could share. So in construction, can you give us? And this is a question, I guess, for uh, for Dave and Amy and uh, Paul. Give us a sense of what you've seen. I guess some of the same questions, some of the do's and don'ts in construction. What are the things that have caused time, uh, time issues? Um, how do you balance interconnection timelines with construction? When do you start construction? Things like that. Um, and you know, I guess the first question is, Dave, how do you, what are, the, what are some of the issues that you've seen with respect to a ground mount versus uh, a, 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 a landfill ground mount? What are the differences in the Sure. Uh, peer supported for ground mount, uh, balanced systems for landfills. Uh, uh, do's and don'ts. Do not hire Bob as backhoe for a landfill. Uh, you must, absolutely, it's an emphasis on must. You cannot be in a project and find a land, uh, bulldozer down the bottom of a landfill slope with all the synthetic ripped out. Uh, it's very easy to happen, uh, very easy for an unexperienced contractor to be on a landfill site, not understand that the, the sand layer below the long layer is saturated, it's exceeded its pore water pressure because the design wasn't done great back 15, 20 years ago, and that dozer now is slipping through and he's hit the synthetic. And it's, it's very easy to run up a $100,000 bill in less than five seconds with a dozer that doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, so that's, that's probably the, the biggest one right off the bat. As far as constructability, uh, just recognize New England weather, recognize you've got to get your piles in the ground. Uh, November. Uh, we don't want to be trying to install stuff and pile piles in uh, at the wrong time. Uh, those are the general ones. I know we're the type of time, so let me pass the baton. Yeah, and the roof, um, we used to say April 15th, but uh, this year, actually, a project started uh, early March because it was such a mild winter, and, um, and they're done. It was a half megawatt. They were done a few weeks ago. That went pretty quick. Um, to have your crew uh, be ready to go, but always work safe. You um, uh, follow all the OSHA guidelines, uh, safety rail on the roof, flag, all that stuff. Have the safety plan in place uh, before they start construction, hold them to it. We do a lot of work as owner's engineer, and uh, we're hired to do uh, commissioning. So we're reviewing the design, the permit set, the construction set, we're visiting the job site uh, once a week, and um, sometimes announced, sometimes unannounced. And uh, that continuous commissioning means that you get a working uh, commissioning paid for by the owner, means that the owner gets the best construction product uh, from their EPC uh, that you possibly can. Um. On the interconnection process, I think the last panel probably dealt with that very well. Um, the, um, the, I think the point 
the most important with bar mines, if you're if you're a small um, if you're if you're a CNI project, um, it's at the where the project's been built at the point of use, you're using the energy on site. It's a fairly straightforward process, a couple of months, and um, shouldn't dictate your ultimate schedule. Um, probably the for a, for a project in 50 plus kilowatts, um, which is about a $200,000 project plus, um, your construction timeline from when you sign the contract, due diligence happens, followed by design, followed by permitting, followed by construction, followed by commissioning. You're probably talking a four to six month process. If um, not unusual for their, one of the pre-development stages to have some sort of a problem, which can add you know, month for month, it will add to your schedule. Um, and on the construction side, um, um, be very careful about your roof warranty. There's, there's normally a pretty transparent process that you go through to maintain your roof warranty. Um, just make sure it happens. And uh, if, you're, if you're in the retail business, um, think about your uh, construction blackout periods, which normally are November, December. Um, and you want to have some safety margin on your construction blackout period. If you're um, in the education business, uh, you typically want to do your construction in uh, maybe June, certainly July and August, a relatively short window that comes up uh, once a year. So think about your, uh, you know, how the construction needs to fit around your day-to-day your -day business. Um, most, uh, most problems can be solved as long as you're thinking about it far enough in advance. Great, thanks. Well, we wanted to real shortly just open up to, to the audience here for questions. A couple things that you should um, be focused on though is post construction manage. What do you do with these modules when, uh, when, when they're now on your roof um, and the installs are gone? Um, and now you have the ability to sell power to yourself or to the tenant uh, or elsewhere um, and sell your solar renewable energy certificates, your SREX. Um, you, you want to look into ONAM agreements, operation and maintenance agreements from the installer or uh, other companies out there. Um, and you want to make sure you can follow up on the other incentives, your, your, your federal, either if you safe harbor, which you might not have, it's kind of late now, but uh, your investment tax credit, you want to make sure your, uh, your accountant understands that. So there's a lot of post-construction um, follow-ups that need to happen to fully take advantage of, of the uh, facilities. I think we'll just do quick closing remarks, um, some takeaways from each of you guys to, to, to think about um, starting with data. There are some great projects underway and a lot of water cup. Uh, the environment is still hot. Um, hire a good team. Make sure your contract is savvy. Um, and just be aggressive. This is a lot of projects you have to be completed. Um, parting words. Um, I'd say uh, Check the references of anyone that you work with. Make sure they have uh, experience on at least uh, three projects of similar size in the role that you're hiring them for. Um, I guess I'd just say do your homework um, in terms of the specific requirements of um, a town um, and reiterate the issue of sort of being proactive in addressing um, the community's concerns. Um, I can only second every every single word said. Pick pick the right business partner. Um, the uh, solar projects make a lot of financial sense. They involve risks. Uh, the markets can be very volatile. So pick the right people to work with and um, you know move forward. Questions? When you sell the SREC, if you market advertise your retail business and you say you're running a business with solar power, can you sell the SREC? So the quick answer is yes, if you want to take it over. Yeah. Well, in, in a commercial contract, the, the, the PPA would normally require you not to mention that you were using solar energy. Um, it, it's it's a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of a vague area legally. Uh, I, I generally would would avoid mentioning that um, if you're selling the SREX. And what you could do is buy. Um, uh, renewable energy certificates, which are much cheaper if, if the energy is generated with wind or new hydro. Um, so if you want to market yourself as using renewable energy, that would be probably the best, what I would recommend. I, I don't know that somebody would take a, a case against you, uh, but I would, I would certainly uh, be, be, I would say, best avoided. 
Uh, Adam, we have, we have a question right here. Thank you. This question is from Michelle. When uh, you're getting solicited from uh, installers and developers, uh, what are the things that you look for You know, when you're screening their calls and make sure which ones you want to go forward with? Um, well, it, in many ways it really isn't up to the community in terms of uh, which ones are going to go forward with. I mean, I'm not really talking about municipally sponsored projects. I'm talking about private development, at least that's been my experience. And it's whoever gets an application um, in. Um, I, you know, I keep saying over and over again sort of the issue of um, do your homework. I mean, town staff certainly wants to be helpful and certainly wants to um, answer questions. We don't want to be in the position of reading a bylaw to you over the phone. So, you know, make an initial inquiry, do some research, and then and then call back with um, with some questions. Hi, I asked the question earlier when, um, uh, regarding net metering with National Grid. And basically, they said they're going to hit their cap this June. So, why would anyone start a project right now if if you can't net meter? Because unless you're using a large percentage of the electricity and you use it seven days a week, it, the, the numbers, you know, especially if you if you have to settle on the, the base of two hundred eighty-five dollars. Does it make sense anymore? I mean, why are we even having this conference if the net metering is going away in a couple of months and there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to move forward? I mean, my company's ready to start a, hundred, a one megawatt project in a matter of weeks. And I, after being here today, I think we're just going to put the brakes on it because if we can't net meter it, it doesn't make sense. I think um, that's a good move. I would <clears throat> sit tight. Uh, today's June 13th. I would use the next, uh, uh, use your time to meet with your state uh, representatives, state senator, and say, are you aware of this issue? Uh, we would like to do solar. Uh, this is, you know, give them the specifics of the project. Meet them in their office or have them out to where you want to do the solar. And say, does this net metering cap make sense to you? And uh, ask them if they would support uh, uh, an increase to that. Because 1%, I mean, that's, frankly, it's lame. You know, 1%, who made that up? Come on. So uh, get it up to 3, get up to 5, just keep going. And, um, uh, but contact your representative and you put the pressure there. That would be a better use of your time than uh, doing design right now. It all depends on the project. It, 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 the one percent cap is is for private projects. My sense is it's a private project. If you have a municipal or public project, it's a three percent. Uh, sorry, two percent cap currently, um, which that isn't isn't look, doesn't seem to be uh, approaching that cap anytime soon. The other thing too, which which goes to Paul's point, is there is current um, legislation out there already passed by the Senate and being taken up by the House now that would increase the caps. So I think that would be a good good move. Uh, let's see what this, the, the House does in the next couple of months. Uh, and hopefully the, the Patrick administration is putting pressure on them to take that specific issue up as well as others um, with respect to renewables by July. Um, so so that's, that's uh, there's a lot of people in your, in your shoes. Um, there's people that are worse off that have actually started construction and are not going to be interconnected in time by the before uh, the the, um, the caps are reached for that meter. The other thing too is there is DPU. Massachusetts is really trying to address this issue. Massachusetts, uh, the Department of Public Utilities, is we mentioned earlier, is, is basically trying to create a DPU queue, a, a system of assurances, so that when you reach certain milestones in your project, those those being uh, you have uh, you've got. Uh, land control, you've got permitting, and you have your interconnection application, really all the things you would need anyway before you start construction, that you can enter into this DPU assurances queue and be assured that you will have net metering. So what that does is allow you to not spend a ton of money on construction before you are assured of having your, your, your net meter. Currently, right now, you're not assured of that until you're actually placed in service. So it's a big issue, but the state is really trying to address it. <coughs> Paul, Mr. Foley. 
have uh, any recommendations on maintenance of panels and also the inverters going down the line, like cleaning the pollen off, uh, and the inverters, I know they got fans in them, is a, is a recommended best practices that we should be doing to improve or keep along the quality. There are, and I'm glad you asked another question, by the way, because you went to your last question. You can wordsmith what's happening to let somebody know that you've got solar on the roof of your building and not say that you're using the environmental attributes, and that's totally, totally appropriate. So I'm glad you came back. The, um, if you use a finance service, the, um, the finance provider, the service provider will provide a, a full service um, O&M, go buy a couple times a year, life cycle. So that, that, that comes with the PPA or the equipment lease. Uh, if you buy the equipment yourself, um, then you do need to engage in a, a relatively simple preventative maintenance program. Um, I normally would not be in favor of clearing snow off of the panels. I wouldn't be in favor of, um, probably wouldn't be in favor of cleaning them in a, um, if they're tilted at uh, 10 or 15 or 20 degrees, there will probably be enough precipitation that will clean them naturally um, in, in a dusty environment. Um, if you've got a construction project next door, then you may want to hose them off every couple of months. Um, and then your, your inverters will likely need to be replaced 10 or 15 years out. Difficult to say that they will for sure, but you need to plan on that eventuality. So you need to have a, a reserve account or you need to have it in your mind that somebody's going to, uh, that you, you'll have to spend 20 or 30 cents uh, a watt on a, on a reinvestment in 10, 12, 15 years down, below, down the road. They don't everything that you said, yes. Um, my name is Kathy. I'm an intern with the Sierra Club, and I think this question is best suited for Michelle. Um, so I've heard several people speak about problems with towns' opposition, um, and you recommended that you know businesses be proactive in interacting with the town councilors. Um, so, what specifically are the usual complaints, and would you recommend any solutions in terms of communicating with townspeople? Um, I think to start off with the simplest sites in the first couple of projects I saw where we had little to no neighborhood or town objections were sites that were already cleared, um, former farmland sites, didn't require any tree clearing, didn't require um, any regrading. So those tend to be simple. So one of, one of the objections is obviously sites that um, require extensive tree clearing. I have two, well one that was just approved last week, and another one is under review. We had a very ugly hearing last night. Um, and that one, you know, it's 30 acres of uh, tree removal. Other about our concerns um, are sort of the, the, the buffer between the facility and people's backyards. Um, and one thing that's come up a lot at public hearings, which, which to be honest, from my perspective, was somewhat of a surprise, is noise. Um, because solar panels um, just don't, it, they're not a large noise producing type of use, but it's something that's coming up as a concern a lot at the public hearings. People are concerned about the concerns, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the noise that the inverters make. Um, and so, one of the panelists earlier mentioned um, I think it was Graham that mentioned the state perhaps producing some information for municipalities. And I think that that would be perspective, uh, I mean, good from, from my perspective, because one of the issues that came up was certainly the applicants have submitted documentation that these, these inverters are very low decibel, um, but the public isn't buying it because the information is coming from a developer. Um, so if the state could kind of back that up and have information sheets that go, look, you know, you, these these facilities are going to be completely inaudible, you know, at the property line. Um, and uh, but in terms of in terms of being proactive, I'm talking about, you know, if you're talking about a facility where there's a narrow tree strip, um, plant some evergreens, put a fence in there, um, and instead of trying to avoid that expense, you're only causing delays. If, if you just, you know, aren't proactive in proposing something like that, which, you know, sort of a visual buffer with the others. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hi. What, what is the reason for, uh, like, a 1% cap by the, uh, the government? Is it safety? 
Well, why did, what's the logic behind it? It's a pretty good question. Uh, it's actually a really good question. Um, the problem with um, the, these, some of these incentives is that they are pushed to the utility companies, the investor-owned utility companies, National Grid, NSTAR, Western Electric, Unitel. Those companies um, are required to realize the incentive, but the only way that they can do that is to pass, it, pass the, the cost of those incentives to the ratepayers. So there's a push and pull in the state. The AG's office and the ratepayers association are concerned with the, the incentives. We have the alternative compliance cap, which is kind of the umbrella for all these uh, renewable energy incentives. Um, and the AG's office is for the alternative compliance cap, but, but it's concerned on how it, it, it trickles down. And that metering um, basically requires utilities to purchase solar credits at a really high rate. Um, they, pass, they basically pass that, that cost to the rate payers. So the, the rates, uh, and you'll see in your, in your national grid that's on um, bill that there's a line item now for energy efficiency, for renewable energy, and now for net meter. I believe, certainly in national grid. Um, that start to concern, to concern the rate base association in that, in the, in the AG's office. So that's part of the cap. There needs to be a balance there. Um, I don't know if, if anyone here can, like, can add to that. that that's what we've seen. I, th I think that's a very positive way of putting it. I, I just think it's a, a lack of imagination. I mean, they just they need to push it farther. If rates are dropping because of uh, low cost natural gas, why not use this opportunity to, to uh, move forward and develop more solar? What's the objection? You know. Um, so I, th I think one percent is like putting your your toes in the water. We put them in. How's the water feel? It feels good. Let's step up to our ankles. You know, let's go to two or six, five, five, six percent. Let's, let's see what that's like. I'm not asking you to jump in the water. You need to learn to swim first. But how about we go on to, up to our ankles? I don't think that's asking too much. It, it seems that Chair Berwick did allude that that's what's going, going to happen. And we're seeing the, the increased caps now. We'll see, we'll see what's going to happen. In, Hey, I have a microphone. I don't have to come up here and interrupt. Let's give a fantastic round of applause for a terrific job. You know, we've gone 10 minutes over on what we promised, but I think every minute was worth it. Uh, we'd like to ask folks to stick around for a couple of minutes. Obviously, we've got exhibitors out here in the lobby, and I hope you all can get some uh, additional value. Thank you again to our presenting sponsors, National Grid, Absolute Green Energy, Bottage and Dewey and Conover and Company. Thank you all for attending. It's a great day. Good morning. My name is Mark Murray. I'm the associate publisher of the Worcester Business Journal. And I'd like to welcome you all to the breakout session number two, the financial side of solar projects. In this session, our panelists and moderator will share their expert advice on how you can facilitate more efficiently and effective financing of your solar projects. Before we get started, though, um, allow me to introduce our panelists and moderator for this session. To my far right, we have Kathy Parker, a partner in Rodman and Rodman PC. Kathy is a partner and is one of the company's most active executives on the Rodman and Rodman Green Team, a specialty accounting practice serving companies and stakeholders in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and clean tech. Kathy came to Rodman and Rodman in 1999. <laughs> She graduated with an accounting degree from the University of Texas. She is also a certified advanced pro advisor for QuickBooks and is highly qualified to assist clients on Peachtree, along with other small business accounting software. Kathy works closely with the Rodman and Rodman clients, providing them strategic guidance and best practices. Welcome, Kathy. Um, to Kathy's right is Craig Huntley, principal of Select Energy. <laughs> Craig has spent his 25-year career in the asset management industry. He is an experienced leader of large financial service companies in the banking and mutual fund industries. As a founder and principal at Select, Craig oversees the company's sales, financial, and fundraising activities. 
Previously, he spent 14 years leading Fidelity Investments' intermediary distribution business, which more than doubled in size during his tenure. He was also CEO of Minneapolis-based Marquette Trust Company and has worked at United Missouri Bank and Commerce Bank of Kansas City. Craig began his career practicing law in suburban Kansas City. He received a master's degree in environmental sciences and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Kansas and received his Certified Financial Planning designation in 1988. Welcome, Craig. Um, to Craig's right is David Costello, Senior Vice President, Commerce Bank and Trust Company. Dave is leading Commerce Bank's solar construction and lending practices, um, and where Commerce Bank has committed more than $30 million of financing to construct commercial-sized projects. Dave has more than 25 years of experience in lending and banking services and works with a wide range of privately held business clients in Massachusetts. He lends money to finance working capital, equipment and real estate purchases, and construction of owner-occupied buildings. Prior to joining Commerce Bank in 2006, he was a lender for Citizens Bank, State Street Bank, and the former Bank of Boston. He started his career with National Westminster Bank in New York. Dave is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate Business School. He's a longtime resident of Sudbury, where he's been active in town government and in sports. And finally, our moderator tonight, this, after, this morning rather, Vincent DeVito, partner, uh, Bowditch and Dewey, and executive director of the Institute for Energy and Sustainability. Vincent is a corporate and regulatory attorney in Bowditch and Dewey's energy and clean technologies practice. Previously, he worked in the General Counsel's Office of the U.S. Department of Energy and has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of Energy for Policy and International Affairs. He advises clients involved in the development of alternative fuel supplies, traditional energy sources, and renewable energy generation. Mr. DeVito currently serves as Director of the Institute for Energy and Sustainability in Central Massachusetts, sits on the Board of Directors for the Northeast Midwest Institute in Washington, D.C., is a member of the Worcester City Manager's Energy Task Force, and sits on the advisory board of Greenopolis.com. Welcome, Vincent. The table is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be at this event today. I appreciate you coming to this particular breakout session. Not because I'm moderating it, because we have the best panelists available today. Um, the solar industry in Massachusetts that we learned uh, from some of the introductory presentations this morning is vibrant, uh, but it hinges a lot upon uh, government subsidies and one of the things you know that folks like us and you guys have been trying to figure out what is the long-term market uh, going to look like uh, and how are we going to continue to uh, finance these projects to meet some of the demands uh, that the utilities and uh, other providers have to meet so in essence that's the uh, focus of today and uh, we'll dive into that. I just have some kind of some opening thoughts here that I, I jotted down uh, with regards to what are the keys to uh, financing solar projects. Normally I don't need reading lessons, but the printer wouldn't give me 18 size font. So, uh, so clearly, of, of any energy project, and it's today's focus is on solar, but in, Solar is no different than any other type of project financing. I mean, the, the fundamentals uh, have to make sense, and this, this panel will, will talk about that. Uh, but that's really the foundational concern of any of any investment. So it's important to know that why solar is different. And why solar is different, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is because of the incentives that are out there. The incentives come in a variety of types, but the ones that we're focused on today are the Renewable Portfolio Standard carve-outs. And they're important because they work. And we're in Massachusetts because there's only a handful of states that currently have the uh, so-called SREGs, the 
some of the states that do have them haven't necessarily uh, had a sustainable market for them. So we stand, uh, Massachusetts stands special and unique for that, and uh, it's a financing opportunity uh, that is available directly as a result of government intervention, if you will. One of the things we'll probably get into later is the problem with government intervention is that if the government gives it, the government can take it away. So one of the things that lawyers do uh, in this type of transaction is figure out how best to document the allocation of risk, uh, you know, based what we know about uh, the market uh, and the uh, transactional structure. I do have some colleagues here today. Uh, I think I saw them. John Diem is here. Let me know him. Uh, Rick Shields, I believe, is here. Mary Feeney is here. Chris Noonan is here from uh, the Institute of Sustainability as well. Uh, that's why the room's so full. I invited all these people. Uh, so, in, in terms of what the experts provide right now, probably about a 6% payback. You know, that's discussable. Uh, but that's, and that's on solar projects. Uh, but by 2020, that's expected to be about 15%. So it's not insignificant. And, you know, in terms of the politics, I guess, behind this, this is supposed to be, well, I guess the politics or the environmental attributes or the fulfillment of the RPS. That's about 300,000 kilowatts of solar expected to be generated in the Commonwealth by 2014 around the corner. Uh, this all has uh, important jobs impact. Most people don't realize this, uh, but jobs in this particular sector uh, have tripled in Massachusetts over the past three years. So these are all you know, significant economic impacts, and I kind of focus on the economic results of energy projects, because in the end, uh, it's really the, the driver. So if a project is developed in states that have these solar carve-outs and receives federal incentives. And, and some of my colleagues here might disagree, but you can figure it that the payback for the project could almost come in three years. Uh, and that's something that's fairly exciting for folks. And the, the states that implement them are really driving uh, those particular markets. So. One of the points here too is states, and I talk about this in other contexts, states and, and the federal government talk about, oh, I want to achieve you know, a certain amount of renewable production in a certain amount of years. And a lot of states do that. So you want 20% in five years, as far as minutes, whatever. Uh, a lot of cities do that. But without these types of incentives in place, it doesn't happen. Uh, so they're important. And one other the thought on this is kind of, you know, what's, what's going on with the federal government? Uh, there's two other thoughts, actually, but one, I'll save one for the panel. But with the federal government and the, the uh, retirement of the 1603 program, uh, what's going to happen? A lot of folks have kind of went out there and bought solar panels and put them in warehouses to try and get them under the safe harbor, the 5% uh, investment. There is, uh, you know, the way I look at this, there's a way to use panels that weren't specified for a particular energy project if it's structured right. So there's still an opportunity for investments that were made in 2011 for a 2012 project, even though they weren't for a specifically identified project. So the 1603 program, although it has been sunset in terms of the 2011 cutoff, there is an opportunity uh, if, if you do some homework still take advantage of that. The application, the preliminary application date is in this fall, I believe October, October 1. Uh, we should not be expecting any type of national renewable portfolio standard. It is an election year. None of, nobody really knows how much is going to shake out at this point. Uh, and other components of financing are, uh, you know, administrative costs, read lawyers, uh, land rights and permitting issues, 
uh, you need to include uh, conducting potential environmental mitigation. There's the grid connection. Which Greg will talk about. I hope. Greg will talk about. I hope. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, an uncertainty and a potential delay. Uh, although not with National Grid, they're sponsoring this event, so <laughs> great. And uh, <laughs> uh, important costs. Uh, there could be system upgrades, and uh, system upgrades <coughs> involve <coughs> cost sharing. So with that, um, I don't know if each of you want to do some opening remarks, and then we can do our, we'll start with the banker, how's that? Okay. And we'll go down. Uh, thanks for uh, listening in advance. I wanted to uh, just make a couple of points. Uh, the uh, Commerce Bank has been involved in the solar market for, for about two years, uh, and uh, it's, it's become a very active uh, line of business for us. Uh, so far, the cash grant has really been a central feature. Uh, what other capital investment can you make where you get 30% of your money uh, back uh, pretty much right after installation? Uh, that has uh, made financing uh, these projects fairly easy. Uh, that, of course, is, uh, is going to uh, slowly but surely go away. Uh, when, to talk about our process a little bit, we underwrite uh, solar loans just like any other loan. Uh, we are definitely not quite to the point of looking at these as tried and true projects uh, because of all the variables that are being discussed today. So we really want to know all about everybody involved in the deal, all the details. Uh, so the, the best thing for approaching the bank is to come with all the information about the site, the contractor, the power purchaser, uh, the lawyers, uh, who's going to own it, and, and the accountants, and, <laughs> and the investors. <laughs> so it's really uh, uh, the, the uh, the developer is the one that is going to educate you and, and get you to the point. Maybe you're using a consultant to get you to that point. Uh, but that's, uh, it, as I'm finding, the, 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 as the projects get bigger, they're also getting more complicated because of the number of players. In terms of the future, we're going to, uh, I've been talking to several people, uh, in, including uh, the folks here, about how this market transforms as it becomes the 30% investment tax credit market, uh, then you, you're talking about lots of tax benefits, not that many people can use them, so how do you uh, structure your financing to accomplish that? Uh, the other thing I've seen come up in the last year is the SBA's role through the 504 uh, financing program. Uh, that's uh, providing some good support and makes the bank uh, more able to participate in a deal that, that is not robustly capitalized. Um, the other thing we're looking at is what might be going on in other neighboring states, uh, and, and, and certainly in Massachusetts, we're, we're very interested in how the SREC market is going to turn out. We try not to, we certainly hope for the best for the SREC market, but we've studied the auction mechanism very carefully to uh, give ourselves comfort that it will work in the end. Uh, last thing I'd say is, uh, in terms of how bank financing fits into solar, uh, it's a pretty simple model to show yourself that uh, you're going to get a much higher return if you use bank financing. Uh, the interest rate market is very cooperative uh, for the last couple of years, and uh, the bank in general, uh, uh, more and more banks are interested in this market because it appears to be a, a moderate risk loan uh, that we can make. Uh, so that's a, uh, you know, we're happy to uh, participate. We're glad that uh, we're helping with the uh, development of solar in Massachusetts. Thanks, Vincent. Um, I'm Craig Huntley. I'm one of the principals of Select, a small regional developer solar projects where we, in some cases, serve in an EPC role, other cases we will install and operate based on financing. When Vincent asked me to 
sit on this panel, my first thought was, boy, a lot happened last year. We had 1603 sunset at the end of the year, and for all of us in the development space, we were great salesmen that last month. We were a lot better salesmen than we thought we were. As you were seeing the end of uh, the grant program, there was a lot of contracts signed with people trying to anticipate and uh, get involved in that. The second thing that happened last year that really helped us was mentioned in the main forum. Panel prices declined rather significantly for a variety of reasons. Less demand in Europe, greater capacity output in China, uh, not to mention the tariff issue that we're talking about, but we saw panel prices decline anywhere from oh, 20 to 40 percent depending on what panel you're buying, and that made certain projects that might not have been economical prior to that uh, financially doable. And then the third thing is uh, the traditional, what I'm calling the sort of the education hockey stick. In 2008, we passed the laws that we've heard about all morning. Um, awareness, visibility to the solar space was sort of at the low end of the hockey stick. In the last, I'd say, 8 to 12 months, visibility is incredible. Our telephone salespeople within our company used to get, well, what is solar and how do you boil the water and where does it go? Now they get, you're the fifth person that's called me. What the heck's going on with the solar industry? So the visibility to the opportunities in Massachusetts has increased greatly. Um, in addition to other states surrounding us, New York soon, Rhode Island now with their uh, smaller program is still a viable one. Um, as I've talked to lenders, probably three years ago, I spent most of my time explaining, educating, trying to help them understand why you'd want to be in this space, with the exception of Dave, he was ahead of the curve. Um, but most community and, and regional banks didn't have a real commitment or an understanding of how you securitize debt, uh, what the risks are, uh, didn't have the expertise within the organization to analyze those risks. That has really changed. In the last year, again, banks have committed a resource not only from a knowledge perspective, but they've out outsourced to some legal support to try and understand what their risks are, and they're reaching out now trying to look to participate in the solar space. Um, the other thing that I think uh, that, that's really happened is that, you know, there's there's more communication with, uh, well, this program is a great example of that, that, with people trying to get out, understand, make decisions. If I were to ask to raise hands around here, about half of you, I think, are interested owners in putting solar on the roof and the other participants in that one way or the other. That level of communication, that level of communi uh, education has really driven growth to the extent you're hearing about that's right. Uh, over, over sales, over provision, and you've heard about net metering. So this is a really evolving industry. I also want to point out one thing. It got a little dour in there after sort of that last five minutes, everybody talking about net metering caps and talking about the SREC values. This is a, a great industry to be in. We'll solve those problems. Uh, the gentleman from the DOER made the point that we've got caps. Those are going to be addressed. This is the direction of our country for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'll get past those issues, in, uh, particularly with the support of people like those in this room today. So I'm looking forward to questions and seeing where I can help. Kathy? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kathy Parker. I'm one of the partners at Rodman and Rodman. Um, we've been working in the green energy field for the few years now. Our primary focus obviously was the 1603 and that's sort of my area of specialty. So I was the one in December constantly on the phone trying to get these guys safe harbor. What we've been dealing with now is a lot of 1603 applications and the safe harbor applications and those sort of how Craig had alluded to had bought a bunch of panels at the end of the year and now it's a question of, you know, is there a safe harbor really safe? And we've been doing a lot of work in that area. But forward thinking, we know that the 1603 inventory is going to be used up relatively quickly. And obviously the safe harbor applications will be in in October and then you have a little bit more time to get your project underway. But what we've been also forward thinking on is looking at the ITC credit. How can we find those tax equity investors out there and help with the attorneys and the bankers and the developers to structure the deal? What will it look like on paper? What would the tax return look like? How will the income allocation look like? The depreciation, the tax credits. The struggling with, de with some of the, the smaller developers and even the larger ones is obviously the soft costs are extremely high. Our fees, attorney fees, everything is it, it, high because these deals are getting more and more complicated by the day. 
because of the tax regulations that exist out there. So what we're trying to do is work with some small developers as well as larger ones to try to cookie cutter it as much as possible. It's hard to do that, it very is, because every person's situation out there is completely different. But we're trying to streamline that more. We've been working with Craig, we've been working with other developers to see how can we get some smaller projects up and running as well as larger ones and sort of reduce those soft costs as much as possible and be able to get you know as much bang for your buck. Obviously, the tax credit is a big issue, and we're gonna, you're gonna hear the word tax appetite. I think that's, that's the new hot word um, that, that's out there, and it's trying to find those who have the tax appetite. And we get that question almost every day. You know, is there somebody out there who can invest in my project? And there's a couple of people out there that we know, but it's definitely probably one of the biggest challenges that exists. I think it's gonna become more of a big challenge as, like I said, the 1603 money goes away. And it's gonna be, working with the bankers in terms of getting the financing, working with the developers and how to structure those deals in a manner that we can get these things expedited up and running because, I mean, we think green energy is the, like Craig said, it's, it's the leading area as part of our country and we feel confident that the government will ultimately, you know, start changing these regulations to help us. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's not part of North Dakota. <laughs> But for the most part, the Northeast, the West Coast, uh, we're in great shape and uh, we're growing. So I, hopefully this kind of gave you an idea of, of this kind of bundles what these uh, transactions are, uh, look like. But there is no cookie cutter uh, with the amount of uh, work I've been doing this over the years. Uh, just it, Everything's uh, unique. You know, you the fundamentals for the bank and you have to attack the opportunity uh, and then you have to figure out <coughs> the tax code. Love that. Um, in any event, uh, I have some questions, but I wanted to uh, give folks enough. This is more or less uh, a square table, round table type of discussion. So if anybody has a, something they would like to ask, please do. Yes, sir. Yeah, if, this would be probably to the banker. If you could uh, talk about a typical loan structure that you see for a mega one scale project. Uh, percent leverage that the bank would uh, accept, what kind of debt service coverage ratio, term of the deal, how much of the SREX have to be hedged uh, for you all to go ahead. Just some basic broad outline for your typical deal. Uh, sure, the, uh, the one uh, megawatt deal that uh, We'll just use we'll use the old numbers. Four four dollars a watt. That's a uh, four million dollar project. Greg's going to correct me if I make any math errors. Uh, four million dollar project. Uh, we have uh, we start really by figuring out who the players are and and what level of guarantee we have. Uh, early on, we did some projects with some very uh, wealthy real estate owners, investors, and they uh, provide a sterling guarantee, and so we had a, a over 80% uh, debt uh, as, a, as a percentage of the cost of the project. Um, but that was also in the cash grant world, and we take that entire cash grant and apply it against the debt. So post cash grant, we'd have about 50% of the cost loan 10-year payout because to coordinate with the 10-year SREX and uh, we, in, in all cases, we had projected debt service coverage of greater than 1.4 times. Uh, now, the, the couple of moving parts there have been, you know, the panel prices, the cost of the project has come down, uh, the interest rates have stayed low, uh, we offer a uh, five-year or ten-year fixed rate, uh, depending on what you want. Um, so that's, those are all the things that have, have gone into it. Uh, we, when we go into, uh, we generally want that good guarantee um, because early in the process there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, now, a year later, uh, we're just closer to that uncertainty than, than we were uh, a year ago. So. Uh, so we, we still want to uh, know that somebody is going to stand behind it and we don't end up just with a project and 
because if the, if the project cannot generate cash flow to service the debt, you want to have something to fall back on. So the guarantee backstops the escrow request? Correct. You're not asking for a specific, uh, uh, you're looking at the credit of it. The, the idea of writing uh, writing a deal where you're kind of banking on the power purchase agreement and you're banking on an escrow contract when when you hear about folks popping up in the market who will buy your SREX for five years, the first question a banker is going to ask is, well, who's who's on the line to make that purchase for five years? We want to know the credit of that person. Just a little follow on because we have done some work with uh, Commerce. However, we've worked with uh, numerous other lenders and it's not atypical to see a debt service coverage ratio in the 130 to 155% requirement. Um, typically, they'll take assignment of the SREX, take assignment of the PPA revenue, um, obviously a security interest in the hard, hard assets, the panels and the racking system, and the inverters, although I've never met a banker that wants to go take those off the roof, so it's, it's highly unlikely they'd ever do that. And then in certain cases, they'll take a personal guarantee or they'll take a second on the property. But really, each deal is structured just a little different depending on that bank relationship with uh, the borrower. And also to understand with the guarantee, you have to have some guarantee in order to get the investment tax credit as well. In terms of uh, the, the SREC market, so the calculation is using the $285 as the floor for these particular transactions. Is that a, a sustainable model? Uh, we, we, we've taken the position that that's uh, sustainable because of the auction mechanism that is in place. Uh, I mean, there's uh, the, the people that designed the, the SREC model on the state level were, uh, were pretty smart people, and their papers, uh, their economic models are very difficult to comprehend when you read their papers. So, uh, but it, but it does kind of have a looping back mechanism that ultimately raises the value of the credit until somebody's willing to pay for it, you know, pay the $300 for it. So. Do you think any of the forward market uh, in, in the SREC world uh, will impact? We've, we've been approached uh, by numerous uh, brokerage companies that want to buy forward. At least three, there's a couple of, out of Texas and one out of Washington, D.C. that come to market with an offer to buy three and five. We haven't seen any longer term than that. But they're buying at a significant discount, which you might imagine, um, as low as $160 and as high as $230 to buy a, a three year and as low as in the high 100s for it. Uh, five years. So, um, you know, that's part of the risk reward analysis that I think any uh, developer or investor in the rate would do is do I think there'll be a normalization that will result in a higher value over that time frame? Or is my lender requiring me to get a bankable contract so that I can borrow the money to invest? So I need the I need the three or five year commitment. So some of that's the risk analysis you do when you're deciding to try to uh, to whether to sell those SREX or not. I have a question for Kevin. We say far to about a megawatt of panels for a specific project for reasons that just happened. That project has become extinct. We'd like to use the project, the panels, on a new project which was never registered. Can we do that? Did you, you didn't file your safe harbor application yet, correct? <laughs> the October, the one that's due October? No. Um, there is a potential, depending on how much the cost is, what PPAs that you had in place beforehand, if any, you may not have. A lot of, a lot of my safe harbor guys didn't even have the, the power purchase agreement. Uh, it depends on the contract that you had, but it, it certainly could be doable. Um, I don't want to just say yes, there's, there's a long like sort of workflow to go through, but we had we did have a lot of developers that just purchased panels and not had a specific project identified, and now they are starting to identify those, and those guys still came in under the safe harbor. And they have to register by October? October 1 is the deadline um, for the safe harbor application, so 
what we we haven't filed a lot of safe harbor applications yet. A lot of the solars are going up now, so we didn't, you know, to, to once you file that safe harbor application, you're locked into that cost, right? So and, and the five percent and, and the total cost of the project. So up until October, we're going to take the we're going to file both at the same time. We're going to file the safe harbor and the full 1603 application, so they match. At some point, we're not going to be able to do that, obviously, and probably around August, September, we're going to start filing the, the uh, safe harbor application if they're not going to be out in service by October 1. Yeah, that's, that's an important point. A lot of folks in the industry, I call them wild cutters, for lack of a better phrase, and went out there and bought panels and thought that they could automatically be safe harbor. That's not the situation at all. The project certainly has to be uh, qualified and uh, to qualify a particular project for the 1603 uh, refund, uh, it does take uh, some significant actuary work. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I, I had a developer the other day who, who called me and he thought that he was safe harbor. And then there's a lot more to it, that's why I just don't want to say completely yes, but you know, uh, are you accrual basis, are you cash basis, what did the contract say, did you pay it at the end, did you take ownership? you know, um, within three and a half months of payment date. So there's a lot of bullet points to go through. Now we're erring on the side of conservative because the Treasury is looking at these and, you know, they're stretching out the time of, of payment on this. So we're erring on the side of conservative. We, we've had had some safe harbor applications go through and we actually just received payment a couple of days ago, so we were doing a little happy dance in our office. But um, I haven't seen big safe harbor projects yet be, be um, approved or the money, because now the projects are just starting to get done. So I think the safe harbor and the full application is starting to get in. So I, I, I'm, I think by the time July hits, we're going to hear some more buzz about if any of them did get kicked back and what they got kicked back for, or, or, or not kicked back, denied, basically. So, but I haven't heard any of them just yet. Yeah, an important point there uh, to complement that thought is the 1603 program at Treasury has a lot of self-policing going on right now. Mm -hmm. I would phrase that. There's not a huge staff there. Mm -hmm. um, and what that results in is applications going in, people receiving their, their monies. Uh, I suspect two or three years down the road there will be some clawback going on once people start figuring out uh, that these applications uh, weren't necessarily accurate. I've even had folks come to me after the fact uh, you know, they maybe conveyed property, the property to uh, a, a nonprofit or something like that. And you know, the, the, the your lawyer's not uh, obligated to dime you out, but uh, you know, you, you either if you figure out that you did it wrong, you either get the money back or you don't sleep it well at night. I mean, this is just kind of the world that this 1603 is in right now. We've got a couple of 1603 applications submitted, and there's a review process, which is typical when you get a notification that says under review or rejected or returned for additional information. We submitted two of the exact same data points, information, design, all the same information. One came back and needed clarity, the other one came back approved. Literally, so you, you have to assume that the reviewer's desk that these fall on is they're humans and they're going to make a decision based on their observation of if it's complete or not. There's not it can't be, or it isn't, at least my understanding, a hard and fast absolutes. But you know, to Kathy's point, you do it as professionally as you can, so you can sleep at night. And that's uh, sleep at night rule always works for me. That email's a good feeling when it comes in, though. <laughs> it's not a relief really comes through. Uh, just in terms of these uh, 1603 grants to Safe Harbor. Um, if something does happen, so you make an agreement with someone who had pre-purchased the panels and it ends up being denied for one reason or another, uh, typically where does the risk fall? So if a developer comes to you and says, I bought these panels and you have made this whole agreement, um, who pays for that 30% of that now? You thought it was coming from the government, that is typically. We, we had our attorney drop our engagement letter, so we're not at risk um, for that. <laughs> um, the answer is I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, when we're doing the safe harbor stuff, I'm actually, I mean, I'm joking, but I'm not. I mean, we specifically say that we're, we're not at risk for that. It, it, the 1603 monies does not come through, okay? The 1603 is in lieu of investment tax credits. So the answer is um, there was a court case. I, I forget when. It was us. 
summer where somebody got denied a 1603 and they went to court and they actually ended up getting it. Um, we have not been in that situation, fortunately, but there is still the investment tax credit that you can go, you know, whether or not you can take those credits, I mean, this is the whole story and why everybody's here, but that is the alternative, because 1603 is in lieu of the credits, but that doesn't mean you can't still take them. Uh, the bank's not at risk either. The bank's not at risk either. <laughs> Thank you. It's you. I'm sorry. And if, you, and if, and if I'm going to be a lawyer, you're not at risk. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to have a job. For those of us that have multiple projects and have purchase panels or separate projects, is it feasible to use the, the panels on the first project that we're in? Uh, okay, so you purchase multiple panels, think in multiple projects, which we use all the panels, and, and just project A. I mean, it, it, again, I mean, it depends on, on uh, how you structure it at the end of the year, as well as the total cost of it. Um, if there was other contracts, binding contracts in place for the other panels. Um, a lot of a lot of solar developers took the, the position and were sort of airing on that that you know they had a project in place with the serial numbers those serial numbers have to go to that project i think though so you can take it a couple steps back and as a developer you may be able to move it with projects but it depends on how it's going to be set up at the end of the year again uh, just sort of you know, those um those criteria but it could be potentially i have a i have a client who's doing that although it got a little gray, so we ended up keeping them into separate projects because it's the yes or no, right, when you get back from that treasury, so we try to err on conservative, and we were getting nervous when moving some panels over because of the way the contract was written out for him, so. Yes, sir. This is a follow-up question for David. So, um, you in your, for your long term, are you guys underwriting to the 285 floor or below that? Uh, we use the 285 floor. Uh, we, the, the only variation really from that is uh, we have uh, entertained these structures and, and uh, done loans where we are uh, have something of a clawback of part of the uh, SREC revenue that exceeds 285 so that the give the borrower the opportunity or the obligation to pay down the loan a little bit more quickly. That way we have less less of a loan balance a few years into the deal when but we don't have a lot of clarity as to what the asteroid market will be. That's the second bank that we've worked with that actually established a sort of premium split. Any value over 285 that you receive in your SREC, let's say 385 is freeze map. 50 bucks goes to the bank and 50 bucks goes to the developer to buy down principal to reduce your risk in our years. Uh, Dave, Dave's one of the couple of them. Yeah, yeah. Does the same quantity get coverage ratio? It goes below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think how that would work. The uh, if, if debt, if, if you don't make the debt coverage ratio, uh, no, I mean it depreciates. Well, if it if you're participating on the upside with that, so. It's just a don't. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're a bank. We uh, we <laughs> the upside for the downside. <laughs> uh, this question for Craig. As uh, someone in the industry um, in, with a real interest in seeing the uh, net metering app expand, do you have any insight on the legislation that's going on that could actually? Um, I think my insight is probably consistent with about 80% of this room. There's a strong, optimistic view that it will that it will be elevated, it will be lifted. I've not read one document that's in opposition to it. Um, maybe uh, some of the utilities might be because they don't want us taking their money. I'm just being a little facetious. But um, uh, I don't have any real insight probably other than what everybody else is in the room. We're optimistic. We're planning forward on that because uh, you know it's critical, as you can tell by the discussion this morning, to developing more projects. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, I, this morning I met, uh, and maybe some of the rest of you did as well, uh, met Senate, Senator uh, Jamie Eldridge, who is the sponsor of that uh, bill, and so. Uh, 
he was here to uh, to uh, show us that he's in, in support of, uh, of the industry and, and uh, raising that capital. So yeah, there's, there's, I think there's two important takeaways on that. Uh, one is there is opposition out there, but nobody's running anything down. And uh, you know the, the, the halls of being in are buzzing right now. Uh, to the latter point, the people that are opposed to it fully understand that uh, it's an election year and that uh, these legislators do need something uh, to issue in a press release. So it, it will take some form in the end. It won't be as robust as it is right now. Anybody else? Yeah, the red right here. Yes. Question for Dave. Um, percentage wise, what are you lending to uh, solar panels that are going on to operational companies versus solar farms? Uh, well, the, the uh, actually, most of our work has been uh, hosted si sites on the commercial roofs. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the rooftop, uh, based on what I've read, uh, I like the rooftop because it doesn't use up land that could be used for other things. It's, uh, most roofs are just sitting there uh, getting the sun on it. So it, they're, uh, but it, the, the model of the company, actually that the owner of the building who perhaps also owns a company in the building, that is something that we've just come across uh, for the first time, and we are working uh, to figure out how uh, how we can put those kinds of deals together. Uh, the if you think about a, a, a typical, uh, let's say, manufacturer or distributor that owns their own building, uh, they uh, it, it, a lot is going to depend on their financial condition going into that project because. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of solar panels to make a, a fairly significant investment for a medium-sized company. Uh, so we just can't say, well, if, you're, if your debt's two million, we can easily double it to four million, and, and you'll be able to pay all that. Uh, the, the other aspect of it is that the purchaser of the power is likely going to be the occupant of the building. Uh, how strong is that? So it's what where I always start saying, okay, who are all the players in the deal? They're almost all the same player. So if it's a strong company that wants to put solar on their roof, probably a, a pretty good candidate. If it's a, a, if it's a, a company that's uh, under some duress, uh, then it's saying, maybe we'll do a lot better if we can get our price of electricity down. Uh, that's probably not the company that can afford really to put solar on their roof. They are always a candidate, though, to get a well-capitalized solar developer to come in and <coughs> put solar on the roof. And that's a model that, I mean, for instance, any, any uh, school or not-for-profit has to have a commercial person to put the solar on and own it because the, the not-for-profit, they can benefit from the cheap electricity, but they can't, they can't own it and get any tax cut. So if you think about uh, all the people that have put solar on schools, they are also candidates to put solar on, uh, on companies that want to use their roofs. It's not as much fun to collect rent on your roof as it is to have solar panels that you own, but uh, sometimes that's, it, it, if you don't have the wherewithal, that's sort of the other way to go. Um, I'm Kathy Doyle from uh, Fireflower Alternative Energy. I work with uh, at least one of my clients. So thank you. Uh, the question I have is there are a number of real estate uh, funds that I've uh, uh, spoken with about doing some uh, solar on their, in their portfolios, but none of them um, will deal with the personal guarantees that are typically required on the loans associated with the individual development on the group. 
how are other people handling that? Um, when you say other, oh, I, I, okay, so I, the way that the utilities are handling it is they're saying, we've got so many assets, we'll just, We'll just uh, raise some money through the bond market and we'll pay 100% of the cost from the proceeds of that bond offering. Uh, the, uh, you know, if you're a, a Con Edison, if you're talking about investing uh, $500 million in building your own solar, and they're not going to mess around with you know, bothering the financing the project individually. So, you know, it, to get away from the guarantee issue, just use no debt. That's one answer. The other answer is, uh, is that um, if, if, there is a, uh, if there is a terrific uh, problem that I'm trying to solve right now, it's trying to figure out how to structure a solar deal and get away from the reliance on the guarantee. Now, the first deal I saw a year ago where it was going to be, uh, you know, the, the only option was non-recourse debt. That's what I was asked to provide. I was financing 30% of the cost of the project, not 80% of the cost of the project. So cranking down the leverage is gonna be one of the one of the solutions uh, to the problem. Uh, I mentioned the uh, the SBA 504 program. If you're a candidate for that, uh, what you're getting there is you can get uh, essentially 35 percent of your hard costs financed by a U.S. government bond, and then the bank's loan is is only going to be roughly 50 percent of the cost of the hard costs. So that's another route to take. Uh, now the SBA, uh, now this is something I just heard yesterday. The SBA requires guarantees. <clears throat> but your tax equity investor comes in uh, before the project is placed in service and the SBA 504 closes about 60 days after you're placed in service. <coughs> So the day that the tax equity investor comes in, there's no guarantee. <coughs> but apparently it will be created later. So uh, maybe somebody else will tell me that that's, that theory is all wet. But, but yeah, you're talking about, uh, according to what I've read, uh, it's, it's the day the tax equity money comes in is the, is the only day that matters. Uh, another question. Uh, what is the discount you're seeing on the tax equity? I mean, no one's going to give you dollar for dollar on, on the tax equity. There's a discount. What, what's the histor history of the range here that you can see? Well, I, uh, I most everything we've done has been a, a cash grant based deal. So I really haven't dealt uh, with it too much. I think the one the one uh, common figure that I've seen is that the tax equity investor is looking for a cash on cash return of 12%. So that's um, that's a pretty good return compared to, to a treasury. And, but, but I don't really know the, the nuances of exactly how you're splitting up the pie and uh, what the what the tail is in terms of the tax equity? Everybody says, well, it's it's all over once the depreciation has been taken, but uh, there actually is a, a tail and an administrative cost where they have to stay involved uh, for a good long time. We've been approached by a couple of tax equity partners, uh, investors looking to buy some tax equity, and that range is, is broad because you're subject to the at-risk rules. So the at-risk rules means that the equity investor is limited to the depreciation equal to his contribution. Um, so that number, and this is give or take fees, how people are getting paid is roughly 110 to 118% of the credit amount. 
for both the credit and the depreciation. Um, again, there's a fee component built into that, so however, depending on how greedy you want to be as a developer, which we're not, um, but it might be, um, that's a fair number. Uh, but you are, again, limited by the at-risk rules, so some of that is how much equity you put into the deal. I should defer to an accountant. I know far less about it. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing out there is, um, working very closely with the attorneys, is some sort of partnership flip or in the beginning the tax equity partner owns you know 99 percent of the company and the other owners own one percent somewhere around that lines and basically based on the llc agreement they get allocated all of the uh, depreciation and the tax credit there's a private letter ruling out there that basically the partnership will flip in five years so then at that point it flips where the tax equity partner has one percent and they have nine percent uh, then the other one has nine percent and it goes on for a little bit more time with the buyout in terms of the return that they're asking i'm, I'm not a, I, I don't know we, uh, a lot of them uh, we haven't gotten that far yet to be quite honest with you uh, we're trying to get them right now to make sure that they're allocating enough kind of what craig says enough that they're putting enough equity to be able to utilize the tax credits and the depreciation at this moment, but we haven't finished structuring the deal just yet. We haven't got that far. Just, just so you know, uh, private letter rulings, well, uh, right. while are instructional, I guess, uh, they, they only uh, apply to the specific taxpayer that asked for the ruling. No, no, they're not guidance or rules. They're not guidance or rules, yeah. Basically, they, they put them out to the public. Uh, so you can use them, but <coughs> that definitely is an asterisk there that um, it's not for you, that, that, that's not in the regulations of the code. So. Yes, has the 1603 expired? From a standpoint of the grant 1231, where they were converting the, the tax credit into the, the payment, that expired 1231. Actually, it expired a year before that, and they extended it a year. But um, it has expired. It's only eligible, and you've heard the term safe harbor here, to the extent you reserved your right to use it last year through a couple of iterations of 5% invested or begun physical so instruction. Like yeah. uh, there's a couple of nuances, but uh, simple answer is yes. So if I were to structure a deal with you and your company, yeah. I have no options as far as that season of career of safe harbor going, going forward as of today. That's correct, other than to take that credit against income of the company or the ownership of the array. Now, the, the, I understand the 30% investment tax credit on solar projects, apparently that is good uh, through 2016. So, good long runway on, uh, on getting the 30% investment tax credit. So it's just a matter of whether you take that tax credit. That's true, and, and also to understand that the credit can carry forward. So, um, if you're if you don't have the ability to use it this year, yeah, I mean, it will carry forward. It, will back. it cannot go back. Um, I don't think it can go back. I'm not 100 percent sure. It can't go back. You can for three years, right? <coughs> one, one, year, one year, one year. Yeah. We haven't had that lecture yet. You have to pay the file to get to go back. It's yeah. For filing. Yeah. The way I explain this to folks is that. <coughs> The state harbor is, I think about it this way, it's really a substitute for the begun construction date or the significant age of tests. So basically, the for a project to qualify, I had to start construction 08, 9, 10, 11. The state harbor is kind of saying, okay, you made this investment into this particular product that was manufactured for you, uh, so you did begin construction, perhaps offsite. There is other stuff that goes into it. That's how I, that's really what it is. It's a substitute for the actual physical being infrastructure on site. Uh, Correct me, your knowledge of the airstrike market, a couple questions. One, um, the developers that are uh, going to be in construction in 2012, 2013, um, are going to come online and say 2013. The floor at that 300 level, well, really the 285, during our construction. Is that uh, is the floor in place until 2020, or is it 10 years from the construction start of the Technically, it's 40 quarters. Uh, it's 40 quarters from commissioning. Um, so once you commission, they give you the right to receive an S-REC credit for a 40, 40 quarters or 10 years. 
they do have the right, I think it's every July, is that right, Vincent? To, to dial that down. So it could go from 10 years or 40 quarters to something less than that, 36 quarters. But they do, they use that dial to try and manipulate the supply demand curve so that you would keep SREF values at a reasonable place. They haven't done that yet. They're still at 40 quarters. Um, but in July, they'll issue what the 13s will be, if I'm correct about that. Maybe. And so the floor price was the Four, four price can move 10%. They can adjust uh, cap price, I'm sorry. They can address the top every year 10%. So right now it's 550. We're not gonna hit 550, so I'm not gonna worry too much about 550. But um, the floor is intended to remain the same. Three years from 2021 to 2023, for instance, for those at 10 years, you feel that that floor would still be in place for those the way I understand it, it's a rolling 10. So yeah, so theoretically, if you installed in 19 you, and they're still at 40 quarters, you'd have through 29. In your opinion, the, uh, the, the quarterly auctions that are going to take place uh, from this year, do you feel that you know, those prices will be holding and not going to the clearinghouse uh, in the year, or do you feel that it's going to go to the well, that's a hundred thousand dollar question for about ninety percent of this room. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, as I review the applications for Interconnect, and, and you, you, you all heard some numbers today that actually were new numbers to me, just at NSTAR. Uh, what did he say? They've got been getting five to ten megawatts a week in application. Well, the RPS for this year, we've ar we've already got projects coming online that will be greater than the 12 demand. And if they're getting interconnect applications, that seems like the right number to me, but it, let's say it's half of that, and two and a half to five megawatts a week, and half of those go, we're gonna blow through our standards, so we're gonna go to four. Uh, the question is, and, and this sort of gets back to my opinion, is that 1603 created this huge bubble in the industry where we had this enormous influx of act, uh, contracts executed, Safe Harbor's purchased the last month, two months of last year. It's like the pig through the snake, the digestion process is slow. We're gonna digest that capacity. Uh, we'll get back to normalization or a more normal curve 18, 24 months out, and we'll probably have a healthy market. We're not gonna see 530 again, uh, I doubt. Uh, I can't imagine the circumstance we would. But I do believe we'll normalize after we sort of go through the digestion of the pig. And um, I'm from the Midwest, so I always use uh, the market. Um, it, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. That's, as I look at it now, I'm trying to analyze what I think is going to build up, what can happen in the industry. Truthfully, a lot of developers moved into Massachusetts when New Jersey fell apart. So we went from 50 installers two years ago to just short of 300 now. Uh, state of New York is going to roll out an RPS. Vincent, you may know more about it than me. I think it's 550 megawatts is in their rule. So you're going to see that uh, that shift of um, carpetbaggers or storm chasers, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I and I think there could be some of that that will help the normalization process. So it is an industry that's chased it around for around incentives for several years. Uh, I think Mike could just add that the the really the floor is the central feature of the Massachusetts program that. In the writings say makes it financeable, uh, makes these projects financeable. Uh, I'm doing a, a project for uh, a New Jersey based operation here in Massachusetts. I went down and met with them and uh, said, You've got all these properties in New Jersey, how come you don't have solar on any of them? And they got a big smile on their face and they said, We were thinking of doing it when the bottom dropped out. I mean, the price of a credit, I believe, went from the 300s to below 100. 600s. 600s to below 100 when, when there was an oversupply situation. So the idea that Massachusetts has this floor is, is I mean, it's part of my life. <laughs> Excuse me. The, but the floor is only for 400 megawatts. And you're going to be blown through that in a year, probably, correct? So. The, the, the floor, if, if, your, if your project is, is qualified and, and, and 
you're on the rolls of the state in time, you have 10 years of, of credit and you enjoy that floor. But from what I understand, the National Grid guy said there's already 400 megawatts in the queue. No. The, okay, the, the, that brings up, the other issue is um, the number of projects in the queue versus the number of projects that will get built. Um, the number of projects that are online. You want to always dissect those numbers. And uh, the other issue that was mentioned earlier is understanding the, the local uh, distributed generation system to, to make sure your interconnection costs are reasonable and, and feasible. Uh, but, uh, but no, if you, if you spend the money to put up a project and you get qualified by the state, you're going to get, under the law, you're going to get 10 years of, of SREX today. Do you know the net metering cap of 400 is the same as the SREX cap? That was the, uh, your, your uh, Scott mentioned the disparity. Right, the, so the Green Communities Act, and again, I'm not practicing law, so correct me if I'm wrong, okay. in, two, in 2008 essentially established the 2024, or the target at 400 megawatts. That didn't necessarily reconcile to the net metering cap of 1% private industry, 2% municipality. And that's some of the work that's literally taking place now. They they sort of passed each other in the night when they set these up. They're all sort of getting back together now and making sure that the net metering cap's reconciled to the targeted growth and build out. Um, it, you know, we use the term the Wild West all the time at the office because this is an evolving industry. Things are changing every day, and it presents huge opportunity for those people wanting to uh, understand the market, assume a little bit of risk, and have some confidence that this is the direction the industry, the company, and the country wants to go. But yeah, to answer your question, Ted, they're, they're sort of getting back to reconciling those two targets. Both of those questions kind of touch on, on one issue, and uh, these particular solar carve-outs uh, and metering objectives are set by the legislator and it's not necessarily law, but really what I call frameworks. You know, when I was a, a lawyer in the state senate, uh, the revisions that we wrote were actually significant directives and they, 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 they did have the value of actual law, but, but now the legislature has kind of morphed into enacting uh, these sketches of ideas for regulators uh, to come into play. And the problem with that is that it's a lot easier to change a regulation than it is to change a law. So it is a risk var variable, I think is appropriately, uh, appropriately identified here. Um, question regarding the tax treatment of the, um, of the grant. So you get your 1603 grant. Um, how, does, how does the entity receiving that pay taxes on that amount? They don't. They don't. Within um, the state? Uh, the state they don't. Okay. The, the, they don't. They uh, basically what happens is it's, it's a reconciliation item from your book income to your tax income. But what you do have to do is you have to reduce the basis of your asset, your project, by 50% of the grant that you have received. So. That, 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 so if you receive 100000 you reduce it by 50 mm -hmm. <coughs> Subject to a recapture period. Right? There, right, there was a recapture period. And then also to, you know, obviously you get to, uh, don't sell the project. You have to, once the 1603 is done, every year you have to, uh, so they have, I don't know, like yeah. 10 questions or something. Last question. Is that just a five point six It's 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 uh it's similar rules. I know there's a, I don't there is a basis reduction. I can't remember. I think it is the fifty percent too. So party's over. <laughs> okay, let's give it up to this panel. Great job. This was a full house, and uh, I know there's lots of questions, a lot of great questions, a lot of great answers, and I know some of these people will be around afterwards for you to uh, network and talk to them and follow up questions with them.